Okay, everyone. Uh, my machine here says that we are recording. Okay, I'm having some technical technical difficulties. Excuse me, I'm trying to get my face on here, but I don't think you'll miss my face. So, um, as long as you can hear my voice, that's the most important thing, and I can go over the lecture. All right. Um, so this is the first lecture of uh, 2023. Class is scheduled for January the 9th. Okay, and this is the uh, this is the winter schedule. Okay, so let me proceed with what I have to do here. All right, so let me do what I usually do. go. Okay, so school code is ENG 107. And this is English composition and reading, so kind of a dual subject uh, class. Hopefully you like it. I hope you remember the name of your school, right? Is it the School of the West or the School of the East? It's the School of the East. Please don't forget that. All right. So let me proceed and hopefully we'll, you know, this will be the first class of the quarter and we'll get into it, you know, have a good time. All right. All right, here we go. A process for every writer. And the man says, I am terrible at astrophysics. I've just never been good at it. Have you ever heard someone say this? Probably not. I haven't. Uh, however, you've probably heard statements like these, and maybe you've even said them yourself. I've never been good at grammar. Okay, there we go. That's a little more close to home. Writing isn't really my thing. I think I'm more left brain, as they say, left brain people, writers and Right brain people are, you know, into numbers and mathematics. So I, me, I must be left brain because I'm terrible at mathematics. Or then this one, I'm just not creative, so I can't write well. Hmm. Okay. So they're saying that these are probably things you've said yourself or heard other people say. These statements have echoed across classrooms all over the country. And the response from most teachers of writing is the same, okay? Are you ready for the magic? Writing takes practice, like most things, unless you are a natural, right? Uh, no one ever woke up being good at astrophysics or mountain biking or piano playing. Even those who might pick up those activities easily had a foundation of skills and practice to build on and each came to mastery of their activity differently. This is true for writers too. This is true for you and for me. Here's the key here, don't forget this. Maybe it'll show up on the midterm. Writing is a process, okay? And although many writers follow a similar process, each writer is unique. That means you, me, and brother Phil. Think of your writing process as your fingerprint. It has the same characteristics as most fingerprints of most people, male or female, swirls and lines and patterns, but yours is unique to you. The key in writing well is to know your process and make it work for you. Next, what is a writing process? So there you go. 
your right is what they're saying here is your writing technique which is your process is unique to you so learn what it is learn where your ability is and then make it work okay. now we're going to get into so what is a, a writing process do we have the basic writing process chart so in the category of audience and purpose, people reading what you do and then what you're trying to say, that's your purpose. You define the audience, who you're writing for. Define the purpose, what you're writing about. And then understand the assignment. So that's if you're in a writing class and the teacher says, I want you to write flowers. I want you to write on this protest that's happening downtown. Okay. Next category is exploration. Explore and choose ideas, explore and choose topic. Okay, obviously this is not the assignment from the teacher. This is when they let you do free writing, so you write whatever you want about. So, excuse me, you should write down a list of ideas, explore them, and probably pick the one you can write the most on and the best on. Not, oh, I like this topic, but I don't know anything about it. Uh, then you're going to have to do a lot of research, and you might not have that opportunity. In class, it's a pop quiz, and then you get to choose the topic too. So the topic is a broad spectrum. And then you can fill that in with smaller ideas as you go along. Next is your thesis. Articulate a thesis or claim, you know, like uh, you feel Del Taco is, uh, Like you, you say a Del Taco burrito, combo burrito is more tasty than a Taco Bell uh, burrito supreme. That's what you put forth. And then you're going to have to put, which is find and create content ideas that support this. So you're going to realize you can't make any type of a statement like just, hey, it's better. You have to prove it. So you have to have ideas that support it. Like uh, I was, uh, I mean, I'm being silly about the topic, but you could write about it. So a uh, number of years back, people started complaining that uh, the ground beef, supposedly that, uh, supposedly ground beef, that Taco Bell was using didn't look like the, ground beef of before. And uh, so they, they didn't sue Taco Bell, but they protested and forced them to uh, have it analyzed. And they had it analyzed in a laboratory. They said, well, our findings is that it's not actually beef, but you can't eat it, right? And then, uh, Del Taco has always come forth and the ground beef looks like ground beef. So that's a point you could use in your support. And maybe you could attack, attack something like maybe they use, uh, you know, milk cheese or something at Taco Bell. And uh, Del Taco uses real cheddar cheese. So you have to prove it. You just can't say it's just to you, it tastes better. <laughs> And then here we have organization. Select the best organizational strategies. And you do that by outlining the plan. So uh, this, the way you should think about that is just like you were up here and you chose ideas and topics, uh, find which one of your points really is the most important or that most people will listen to, right? So again, I'm trying to make this, you know, this silly comparison, but it's true, you could write on it and it's very easy to understand. 
probably more people are worried about fake meat, fake or like fake beef from Taco Bell. So that could be when you concentrate a lot of your writing on. They would be more worried about that than, well, you know, they use a cheaper milk cheese. The punch is really in, well, if it's not beef, well, you know, you say it's safe, but it's chemicals. What kind of chemicals? I don't think that's good for my body, right? So you outline a plan and you select the best operational strategies that will get your point across, okay? All right. Next, we go into drafting. Okay, write the body of the paper. That's the middle part. Introduction is the first part, if you remember. So the middle part's the fullest part. If you're given time, if it's not a pop quiz, then you'll have time to research or explore for more content. That being the case, you might find more information uh, supporting your claims about uh, Del Taco being more authentic using real ingredients. Who knows, you might find out that Taco Bell's uh, tortillas are even fake, right? Uh, next, working on an intro, conclusion, and title. So there you go. I want you to write the main part first, all the, <laughs> excuse the joke, beefy part, and then work on your introduction, which again grasps your reader's attention. Then the conclusion, at the end, which is kind of like your, it's your final point and your summary. And then the title last. Now that might be confusing. Some people might say, oh man, don't you put the title first? Isn't that what you're supposed to do? You know? But in my experience, it's interesting, you come up with a snappy title, but you know, uh, strategy-wise, especially if you're pressed for time, a lot of people waste a lot of time trying to come up with a snappy title. And then sometimes they kind of have to struggle trying to write a paper that kind of fits the title. When the better strategy uh, given to me by, you know, excellent writers is Write that body, write the end, write the conclusion. And then when you're done with the paper, a lot of times the perfect title jumps out from the paper, which is the difference of trying to write. Think of a title first, okay? So it's just some strategy for you. And then the revising, refocus on audience and purpose. So when you revise it, you go over it and throw out the mistakes or throw out parts you think are unnecessary or too long. And then go back over again on your audience and purpose and see if you have gone away from your purpose or your audience. So for example, uh, again, let's say your audience is senior citizens, right? And that's how your paper started, the intro. But through the body and by the conclusion, you started talking mainly about young adults. Well, you've changed the audience with your paper. So you're going to have to revise it. Okay? And the same with your purpose. If you started with the Del Taco combo burrito versus the Taco Bell uh, burrito supreme, but by the end of your paper, you're talking about chicken McNuggets that are not really made of chicken and they come out of a tube. Well, you're completely off track now. You're still in the fake food business, but that's not what your paper was supposed to be about. It's Del Taco versus Taco Bell. So if these are things that you've done, then you have to make major changes in your paper. Okay. And then use peer review and other feedback. So like, you know, if you're given a paper to write and so they give you so much time, once you write it, uh, if you have a classmate that you're friends with or your roommate, 
brother or sister, they're your peers. So let them read it, give you feedback, say, this paper sucks, or, hey, this is good stuff. Or, you know, if you're just looking at pure criticism, the guy might say, I'll never eat a Taco Bell again. Thanks for letting me know these are secrets of Taco Bell's fake up. Ooh. So you always need a third person to look at it. Okay. And then once you have your changes mapped out, you can redraft it. All right. You have to do it again. But this is all. Uh, some writers say this is the most important part of your paper is revising it. Most people really don't like doing it. Once they finish writing a paper, they're like, that's it. I'm done. I'm tired. But this will save your score many times. And then it has to be more thoroughly done as editing. So you edit for what? Consistency. Again, don't go off purpose. Don't go from burritos to chicken McNuggets. Okay, and then you edit for style. Uh, that being said, are, is yours, the style, is it just like a fact for fact? Is it uh, kind of a funny style with some facts, but funny situations thrown in, you know, so you have to edit which is the better style uh, that you should use or an angry, there's a lot of people that write angry papers now. So is it an angry style? Like how dare they, you know, and what they charge and those chemicals have been found to, you know, make horses crazy. What is that doing in my, you know, burrito sauce? So um, yeah. And then check sources and research. So you got to check. Uh, if you have the time and they let you research, research sources, make sure your sources don't come from the onion, which, you know, is the fake paper from New York. Make sure they come from reputable sources, which is kind of tough nowadays since we have a lot of fake news running around. So that's that. And then, of course, you proofread, which may, I think is even more annoying than revising. But you fix grammar. That's where you find, oops, why did the sentences in past tense and I wrote the, the verb conjugation in future? What was I thinking? And the same thing with spelling. And then capitalization errors. Sometimes you need a capitalization book. Some things needed to be capitalized or you thought they were capitalized and then they're not. So... And then you just look for small missed errors and consistencies. I'll let you know if you don't know already, some professional writers, like I said, um, they don't like this revising and proofreading. When they finish their paper, they will pay someone because they're going to get paid for the article. They'll pay someone to go and look over the small missed errors, right? Right. Or do it on a computer, you might have a spell check for it. Proceed reading on the top here. As you can see, the process goes back and forth. Writers might have a thesis and organization and begin drafting, which is writing. And they might realize the thesis isn't working, so they go back and revise the thesis. Smart. Then the organization will need to change to organization of the paper, not a company. Once the draft is done, the introduction and the conclusion might need to be rewritten because they no longer address the audience and purpose. Like I said, if your paper started out uh, aiming at senior citizens. And by the end of your paper, you're talking about how angry 20 somethings are about fake chicken McNuggets. You're not addressing the same audience or purpose. Okay. Um, when revising, writers should be going back to all of the previous parts of the process thinking about whether the writing meets audience and purpose, whether their the thesis still holds true, if the organization is still working, if the style is still clear and consistent. You always want it to be clear and consistent. You don't want it to be confusing or strange. Like, you know, some people, let's say, let's say you write the paper again and then you're pointing out how you know, Del Taco 
is better because it's using real beef and real cheese. Okay, so you're on purpose there. And then at the end of your sentence, you say, but I still think Taco Bell is delicious. Okay, now you've become, you know, or more delicious. Now you've become really confusing. People are like, what the hell is going on here? If you're going to say it's not good, you can't say it's your favorite. Okay, you, have to, you know, still say it's not good. <clears throat> Revising sometimes means scrapping everything, means throwing everything away and starting over. Yeah, you might not like it at all, or there might be too many uh, kinds of problems in the unity of the paper. And you say, or, you know, some people don't have enough. That's why I, I said, make sure you write that body first. You got to make sure you actually have enough information to make it good and meet the length requirements. All writers have a process. So you'll learn yours as you do your papers and then you'll be quicker to write these kinds of things. Let's look at an example, something we do all the time, like writing a grocery list. Even writing a grocery list is a process. Did you know that? Hmm, I bet you didn't. Who is the audience? Is this for me or someone else? That informs other decisions. What is my purpose? Do I want a huge shopping trip, multiple stops, or a short in and out like more most young bachelor men? I'm going in for the beer and I'm coming out quick. Uh, once audience and purpose have been thought through, the following steps might be taken. Exploration. What do I need? Make a list. Thesis. Create a heading that leads the audience to the goal. Are you shopping for a major event like a party? Are there specific needs of your guests? Are some are vegetarian? Some demand gluten-free, right? Uh, organization. Redo the list on organization for a grocery store. It might be how the store is laid out. Grocery, meat, canned goods, condiments, dairy, bread. Your goal is efficiency. Get in, get the stuff, get out. So that being said, uh, if this is something that you have to do a lot, like get in and out, then then because uh, most people don't really know the store in and out and go, I know exactly where the meat is and the canned goods. People still go around, where's your canned goods? Uh, uh, condiments are what aisle, right? So it's a subject where you have very limited time, but you're gonna go to the store a lot, then you should go on your off day or something from work and then make a list so that you can do this. Otherwise you'll be running around like a crazy person, okay? It's a process. All right, draft. Write the list in the organizational format chosen. Here's your shopping list. Revise. Look it over. Is it legible? So what that means is, can you read it? If you've ever gone to a doctor, you know, they have four years of college, then they have seven years of medical school. That's 11 years, and then maybe a couple more. And so they're so intelligent in medicine, and when you see the, re the prescription they give you, nine times out of 10, you cannot read the prescription that the doctor wrote. It's like, is this guy really educated? So is it legible? If the audience is someone else, will they understand what it all means? So again, if you're a highly technical person and you're writing a paper about a technical field, you better that paper better be for people in your field the regular people like me might not understand what you're talking about. So that's not a good paper. Did you miss anything? 
some people missing important parts of their pay. Do you need check boxes like these? Do you need to add specific brands, types, or description? Like uh, you just don't say macaroni and cheese, but you want craft macaroni and cheese, not the generic. Uh, what is it like no brand or something? You know, you want the Heinz Fifty Seven ketchup. You know, not the Ralph's ketchup or the Vaughn's ketchup or Louis ketchup. Edit. Are the spelling in words consistent and clear? Proofread, check to make sure everything is there, every point that you wanted to make. If you, again, going back to the topic I gave you, if you said that Taco Bell was, I mean, uh, Del Taco was better, but you forget to show why the beef is better, you just talked about the cheese, then uh, not everything was done, all the boxes were not checked. So throughout the rest of this book, this process shown simply in the example above will be explored and explained in detail. In writing, the trick is to find your process, see what you do and how you do it. That should be one. So I can make sure everything is there. Okay, think about the kind of writer you are. What kind of writer are you? Are you a sprinter? Remember, sprinters run very fast for a very short time. Do you have lots of ideas and want to get them quickly? If so, you probably skip to drafting and spend a lot of time on revising. Try spending more time on the start of the process. Spend more time on defining audience and purpose and on exploring and planning. Then revising might not be a Herculean or giant task. Are you a jogger? I mean, someone that can run for a long time, many miles, what is a marathon, 26 miles? Do you try to go through the writing process one step at a time? Maybe some parts are harder than others like organization or writing a thesis. Try new strategies for those parts of the writing process that are most difficult. If revision is hard, get lots of feedback and learn to critique others. Feedback is good. Try new strategies is good. If audience and purpose make no sense, Spend some time looking at, at how other writers bend their writing to their audience purpose. Sometimes you'll get a wild writer. He's not even caring about the audience. He just has to yell out his problems and his grievances, you know? But then again, I don't know who is going to be the bulk of... Uh, his readership, he's not really aiming to uh, really inform a certain group. So he's probably going to get low numbers on that return, right? Next is, are you a tightrope walker? Do you want everything to be perfect before you set it down on paper? Oh, those kind of people don't do well with deadlines. Are you a perfectionist? So you probably spend a lot of time at the start of the writing process, but have more time or trouble that is revising, like I mentioned earlier. Try being willing to make changes and revision based on looking at organization, audience, and purpose. Is everything in the paper really working together? Don't be afraid to get rid of parts and start over. So don't be afraid to, to say, oh, the middle part of my body, I can get rid of that. 
or in my summary, I don't need to mention these things, right? Don't be afraid to throw those out if they take away. You know, that's what happens in movies, you know? And uh, that upsets a lot of actors. Like, there's a movie you liked from five years ago, and then some actor will come on a talk show, and he says, I was in that movie. And you're like, no, you weren't. I saw that movie. You weren't in it. But they filmed a scene with him, or maybe longer. And when the director was revising the movie, he decided this didn't fit well with my purpose or the timing and uh, the actor got paid but he got cut from the movie so you never see the person in the movie so those things happen there so you're in charge of your paper don't feel bad about being rid of some of these parts okay reading with purpose. If you don't have a purpose, your reading is going to suffer, right? So starting at the top here, even if you consider yourself not much of a reader, you read something each and every day. A magazine article, instructions for hooking up the DVD player, telephone messages tacked on the refrigerator, Notes from your latest heartthrob, or what we call now crush. Regardless of what you are reading, you have a purpose that dictates or tells you how you are going to read it. And you read different items in different ways. You wouldn't read the DVD player instructions as you would a novel of different styles any more than you'd read a magazine article in the same way as a grocery list. Without purpose, you'd find yourself reading aimlessly and very inefficiently. Fortunately, many of the students I've talked to have not yet realized the importance of having a purpose for reading. Yeah, I don't, what's my purpose? I don't know, I don't have any idea. Their lack of reading purpose can be summed up by the proverb, if you aim at nothing, you will hit the bullseye <laughs> every time. So if you don't catch that, it's, I'll give you a, a different way to look at that, what they're trying to say. It, they're trying to say is, if you don't try to accomplish anything, then you will be successful every time because... You're not putting in any effort. You're not going to accomplish anything. And then you don't do it. And hey, you're a success at not accomplishing, right? Next. Before you can understand what you're reading and remember it, you must know why you're reading it in the first place. Right. You can't be sitting there and then someone says, what are you reading? Uh, it's a comic book. Why are you reading a comic book? I don't know. Uh, uh -huh. Right? You gotta know why you're reading whatever you're reading, novel in the first place. So you have to define your purpose for reading. What is your purpose for reading? If the best, the best answer you can come up with is because my teacher said I had to, <laughs> we need to uncover some better reasons, right? Reading a chapter, just so you can say, I finished my assignment is relatively futile, which means like hopeless. So what they're saying, some people just read a chapter. Okay, I finished it. And they don't remember anything they read about because they were just speeding. What it starts on page two and ends on 20. Okay, I'm just going to try to read this as fast as I can. And you ask them some of the points that were covered in that first chapter, and they're like, I don't know, and it was about oranges, uh, but I finished it in an hour, so let me leave me alone, you know. Uh, if that's the case, you may as well put the book under a pillow and hope to absorb it by osmosis. So osmosis, they teach you that in biology class. So they're trying to say, you put it under the pillow, and hopefully you can absorb the reading knowledge 
withdrew the pillow from the book, right? It's just not going to happen. Unless you identify some purpose for reading, you will find yourself flipping the pages of your textbooks while seldom retaining anything more than the chapter titles. Right, and that's what they'll do. Well, chapter one was oranges, chapter two was a kumquat, three was a pomegranate. Okay, so what about the kumquat? I don't know. They're tiny. What about a pomegranate? What did you read? Okay. See? That's all you'll get. So, according to reading experts, there are six fundamental purposes for reading. One, to grasp a certain message or understand a certain message. Two, to find important details. Three, to answer a specific question. Four, to evaluate what you are reading. Don't forget those. Maybe they come on the homework. Oh, five. Okay. To apply what you are reading. To be entertained. Yes. Sometimes it's just for entertainment. Applying what you're reading might be like reading a car book. And it's telling you like how to fix the brakes. You know, work on a catalytic converter. Who knows, right? Because reading with purpose is the first step toward improved comprehension. Yes, you have to have good comprehension. Let me suggest some simple techniques you can use to identify purpose for your textbook reading. Find the clues in every book. This is a group of special sections found in nearly all textbooks and technical map materials. I'll repair it's a technical material. In fact, in all, almost all books except novels that contain a wealth, a lot of information, it can help you mean or take from the reading more, more from the reading. Becoming familiar with this data will enrich your reading experience and often make it easier. Here's what to look for. The first page after the title page is usually the table of contents, a chapter-by-chapter -chapter list of the book's contents. Some are surprisingly detailed, listing every major point or topic covered in each chapter. Next at the top, the first pro section after the title page, table of contents, and perhaps an acknowledgement page is the preface, the description of the information you will find in the book. Authors may also use the preface to point out unique aspects of their book. The introduction may be in place or in addition to the preface. Written by the author or by some name, the author has recruited to lend additional prestige or respect to his or her work. Most introductions are even more detailed overview of the book. Chapter by chapter summaries are often included to give the reader a feel for the material cover, to keep you up to date and really know what's going on. Not pomegranates uh, read. Footnotes may be found throughout the text. A slightly elevated number following a sentence, quotation, or paragraph. E.g., Shim, Dandy. And either explain at the bottom of the page, which they appear, or in a special section at the back of the text. Footnotes may be used to cite sources or direct quotes or ideas and or to further Explain a point or add information outside of the text. You may make it a habit to ferret out or look for sources cited for further reading. If a text tends to use an alarmingly large number of terms, which you may not be familiar, the considerate author will include a glossary essentially an abridged dictionary that defines all terms. The bibliography, usually at the end of the book, may include the source material the author used to research the textbook, a list of recommended reading or both, 
It is usually organized alphabetically by subject, making it easy for you to find more information on a specific topic. Appendices containing supplementary data or examples relating to subject matter covered in the text may also appear in the back of the book. The last thing in a book is usually the index, an alphabetical listing that references by page number every mention of a particular name, subject, and topic in the text making it a habit to utilize all of these tools in your textbook and only make your studying easier. It's kind of like free notes. Okay, continue. Look for clues in each chapter. Every textbook offers some clues that will help you define a purpose for reading. Begin with very few quick overview of the assignment, looking for questions that you'd like answered. Consider the following elements of your reading assignment before you begin your reading. Much like the headlines of a newspaper clue, view into what the story is about. These elements will give insight into what the section or chapter is trying to communicate. Chapter heads and subheads. Chapter titles and boldface subheads announce the detail about the main topic. And in some textbooks, paragraph headings or bold-faced lead-ins announce that the author is about to provide finer details in the reading. We'll start each reading assignment by going through the chapter, beginning to end, reading only the bold-faced heads and subheads. For example, suppose you encounter the heading, The Fall of Communism, in your history textbook. You might use it to formulate the following questions. What caused the fall of communism? Who caused it? When did it fall? Why did it fall? Where did the fall occur? As you read the chapter, you find yourself asking these, seeking answers to these questions. You now have a purpose, right? So you just read the heading about the communism. And then make your own questions and then look for the answers of your questions. And uh, you will know. As you read the chapter, you'll find yourself seeking answer to these questions. You now have a purpose. Often you may find headings that contain words or terms you don't recognize. Seeking to define these terms or explain a concept should then define your purpose. This process of headline reading takes only a few minutes, but it lays the groundwork for a more intelligent and efficient reading of the chapter. You'll have some idea of where the author is headed which will give you a greater sense of what the most important details are and clarify where you should be concentrating your studying. End of chapter summaries. These are good and juicy with a lot of information. If you read a mystery from start to finish, the way the author hopes you will, you're likely to get thrown off the scent by red herrings, and other common detective novel devices. Red herrings are something they want you to get interested in that takes you away in these detective novels from the truth, right? However, if you read the last page first, knowing the outcome will help you detect how the author constructed the novel or built the novel and built an open and shut case for her master sleuth or inspector. You'd perceive a wealth of details about the eventually unmasked murderer that might have gone unnoticed had he been just another of the leading suspects. They usually have that like dinner party. But he's like, well, who is it? It can't be that guy. Similarly, knowing what the author is driving at or pointing to and in a textbook will help you look for the important building blocks for these conclusions while you're reading. How do you get that? 
you read the last page first. You know what the end game is. It may not be fun to read a mystery novel this way because you want to read it and be shocked at the end. But when it comes to your textbooks, it will help you define your purpose for reading. So you're after that assignment right now of being entertained by the detective. And further, it will transform you into a much more active reading reader. Again, looking for purposes, answering more questions, making it less likely you'll doze off or fall asleep between the fall of Rome and the Black Plague. Okay. Opposition. Questions. What does it take to get good at? writing. Okay, that's your first question of the first week. Two, why is writing like a fingerprint? I mentioned this earlier. Three, in the basic writing process chart, what are the three steps for audience and purpose? Four, when revising, what should writers do? Right. Should they ignore it? I don't want to do this. Or should they get to do it? Right. But that's not the answer. Don't say that. <laughs> I've had some students in the past. When revising, what should writers do? Revise. That's not the answer. Okay, folks. Next, you should be willing to make changes in revision based on what? Okay, so this one is kind of like saying, why do you revise? What are the reasons? That what that's what this question is saying. You should be willing to make changes in revision based on what? What are the reasons? Okay. Now we have our reading questions. One, how will you read if you don't have a purpose? Very important. That's the one thing you get from this quarter's class. It should be that answer. Next, what are the six fundamental purposes for reading? I hinted that this might be questions, and it is. So, uh, I'll, I'll be kind. I'll even give you one of the six. The last one, which is uh, one purpose is just for entertainment, right? So I know this is second question. It's like six questions in one, but, you know, I'm trying to get you to know all the material. So I'm telling you that of the six, the last one, number six, is reading just for entertainment. I don't know if you guys, any of you guys have gotten to that point yet. Where, meaning if you're not forced to read a book in your college classes, you just pick up a book to read it. Now I'm talking about a magazine, comic book, an actual book, like we said, a detective sleuth or a novel. You know, so hopefully you can get to that point number six. All right. But you have now supplied me one through five purposes. Okay. Don't don't say, oh, the teacher gave me the answer. There's six answers here. I gave you one. Okay. Next, name some tools in your textbook that can make your reading easier. So they listed a few tools there to make it easier. It's not as long of a list as two. So you should have done that better. Or you should start reading from beginning to end by only reading which things. Are your, they're talking about looking for main points here, but you know what to do. Don't forget the technique I just showed you for trying to read a detective novel, right? And helping you find a purpose if you're really, really stuck. I don't know what's my purpose for the writing something. So you read these things and it'll, the practice will give you the purpose. If you spend some time reading headlines, how will this help your reading? So explain how reading these headlines will help you. If you remember, we talked about the one, the example was uh, communism, right? 
Well, if you read the headline, how can this help your reading? And then how does that turn into your writing? They kind of mold into each other. Okay, so I think that's it, right? Right, okay, so I just try to bring us in easy the first week. I'm letting you guys go a little bit early, right? A little bit under the, the time frame. Because uh, it's tough. This is probably the toughest uh, break to come back from the holidays, you know, Christmas and New Year's. And it's really tough to get back into school. So, like I said, today's lesson is kind of a little short. So, uh, I shall uh, let you go and look forward to seeing you on the 16th of January. Go. So take care, everyone.